yeah. I love my HBCU. And bar? I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he going to teach a lesson. Yes. And welcome in to another episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Charles Bishop here with you on another Tuesday. It is July 23rd, 2024. MEAC Media Day. We'll get into a lot of news and notes with regards to the MEAC Media Day, but we want to welcome you to another episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show. Covering the sporting HBCU diaspora and all things HBCU sports for the institutions large and small from the NAIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture and HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs and the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Charles Bishop, along with my host, A.D. Drew, as well as Wilton Jackson. Who will be stepping in, internationally acclaimed, world-renowned journalist, Wilton Jackson, the face of uh, HBCU uh, News and Notes, A.D. Drew, man. Welcome, guys, into another episode of The Lab. What's going on, Charles? What's going on, Wilton? Nice to have you back in, brother. I know it's been a minute. I've been, I've been <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> What's going on, A.D.? While some of us have been on our summer sabbatical, uh, Wilton, I have been all <laughs> over the place, uh, you know, traveling, covering HBCU sports, uh, uh, AAU, some of the shoe tournaments that they got out there. I've been trying to get it in. My brother's been trying to get it in. No that. doubt. No doubt, man. Oh, welcome in, lab listeners. Edwin Moore, thank you for dropping in. Of course, we're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to our KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University here from Houston, Texas. Welcome in to all of the lab rats. Let's get it in. It is another week of HBCU News and Notes. We start here, uh, and we're going to get to uh, MEAG Media Day. We had some, for me, I'll put it that way, my opinion, a surprise or two, you know, uh, just like with Swag Media Day. I was like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, hmm, Wow, they're paying attention to uh, some of the personnel at some of these uh, uh, institutions, but uh, we'll get to uh, you guys' thoughts and insights with regards to uh, MIAG Media Day because uh, in about a week or so, guys will start reporting. In fact, they probably start reporting this weekend, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and it'll be time to get it up once again. Man, Wilton, AD, football season is it's upon us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a skip and a hop away. It's not even months away anymore. I mean, you talk about, like you just said, uh, practice is starting soon. Summer practice is getting players out there uh, in the heat and, and, and just, he just hearing some pads crackle against somebody else. I mean, it, nothing beats that sound. Uh, you know, AD, I said, uh, you know, it'll be one or two coaches. They might get a gift basket right before uh, fall practice starts. And, you know, they're making those last calls like, y'all, you good? What, what, what you thinking? <laughs> you know, you you, gonna, you might see that over the next uh, two, three days, A.D. Yeah, you know, you everybody's been watching the Twitter and everything else about so-and-so is committed to this school, so-and-so is committed to that school. Let me tell y'all a little secret. <laughs> if they were not enrolled in summer school, I would start to be a just, just a little bit. Now, you know, some, let's give some of the benefit of the doubt. They may have had uh, uh, previous internships already set up for their major and stuff like that. You know, we got to give, give those a yes. doubt. Yes, yes. So, yes. So uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, let's be real. Florida A&M 
and Norfolk report report next week. They're the first two to report because they've got that week zero game and anybody else who's playing in week zero. And so let's be and you, you, it's going to be so refreshing once these teams report and we actually start covering football because I'm going to be real, y'all. <laughs> Have you ever just wanted to unplug a month or hit the control alt delete button on a month in your life? Not only in your athletic life, but your professional life. Just hit control alt delete and the reset button because this month has been woo. Yeah, totally uh, crazy. Totally crazy. And then you add, you know, EA Sports College Football got released, so. It's already thrown. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. You don't need to reset that part. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We we'll get to all all things that are MIAC, uh in the next segment, but let's take a look at some news and notes from around the HBCU stratosphere. Uh, HBCU rivals highlight the CBS Sports Winter Broadcast Showcase. Jared Hoffman from HBCU Sports put this out there for us. A few of the fiercest rivalries in HBCU lore are set to take center stage during the 24-25 basketball season as part of the CBS Sports Classic HBCU Showcase on December 28th. And, of course, we have North Carolina Central at North Carolina a and And then you also have the Battle of the HUs, Howard at Hampton, two great rivalry games for the CBS Fall Force Sports schedule. Uh, your guys' thoughts on, uh, we got some good basketball uh, in that little Christmas break uh, time there. Yeah, that's also like a, a typical time where you see a lot of these early season games between, you know, um, sometimes it's interconference, uh, like in this particular case with, with um, you know, Howard Rail former uh, teams in, in, in the same conference. But when you look at that, it's just like you, you get some good basketball. Uh, shouldn't be a blowout in either of these games. Um, and, and teams that relatively know each other well. So you, you get that continuity. Uh, you bring it into like a, a classic setting. Um, and granted, this is what a couple of days after Christmas, maybe three days after Christmas, you might yeah. get some pretty decent crowds. So I think it's good. No doubt about it. AD, your thoughts? We used to call this be at conference play once upon a time. That's that what I was true, getting at. But... I was about to say, yeah, and old be at rivals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. used to call this be at conference play. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to just see. Sorry to steal this from you, John Grant. Is the rivalry real? Because we know what this rivalry looks like on the green iron. Yeah. I've heard that because you've moved in inside and everybody's confined and everybody's on top of each other, I've heard the basketball rivalry between these schools is even more intense than the one that we traditionally know as football fans so it's going to be interesting and correct me if I'm wrong both of these games will be played in Hampton if I do have that corrected so while Hampton would have a home court advantage against Howard the other game would be a neutral site game so it's going to be interesting to see what that central A&T crowd does up there in in the Virginia Beach area, but if if you're up in that area, oh, why not? What day of the week is that on? I'm curious. I didn't even look it up to see what day of the week that's on. I don't even know what let day. Me, let me pull out my calendar. What day Christmas what? is? I mean, most of the most of the time, we always looking for something to watch. Oh, right. I was about to say, oh, oh, bro, that's a Saturday. <laughs> this is a Saturday, man. <laughs> so you get you get a little basketball on, on a Saturday in the midst of bowl season, huh? Yep, yep. Right. The only thing that I'm concerned with with this event is uh the new CFP and will that dis- will that pull some people away with the new uh, college football playoff. But you know, uh, uh, if if you're if you're in Georgia and Georgia is playing, you might not be watching this game. You know, if you're in Alabama and Alabama Auburn is playing, you might not be wa- same thing with y'all down there in Texas. If the Longhorns are playing, you might be watching that game, but for for the rest rest of the people, hey, it's a good opportunity to uh to watch some uh, good HBCU basketball. 
No doubt about it. And then you highlight the part of uh, uh, teams being former fierce rivals within the MEAC. Uh, you get an opportunity to take a look at that rivalry once again. So I'm looking forward to it, uh, especially, like you said, you get a little break from some of the bowl games. And it's like, yeah, I got a lot of HBC basketball on. So uh, kudos, CBS Sports, putting that out there uh, for all of our hoop heads, especially around Christmas time when I start dialing in for a little bit of uh, HBC basketball myself. Uh, yeah, well, I might uh, even go apply for some credentials for that one. You never know. <laughs> there you go. I, I, you know, of course, AD, the man who gets around to each and everything uh, from the south <laughs> to the east. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, AD. Get it in, brother. Uh, and I will, uh, as we move to break, and I want to close this segment out on a, on a bit of a somber note, uh, as we do want to uh, acknowledge the passing of a former Grambling women's basketball standout, Jasmine Boyd. Uh, Jasmine Boyd was a key part of Grambling's most recent uh, NCAA women's basketball tournament team date in 2018. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away. Uh, and this is a statement uh, with regards to uh, Jasmine Boyd from uh, Grambling 80, Travion Scott. We are deeply saddened by the loss of our former women's basketball student athlete and, and GSU alumna, Jasmine Boyd. Our thoughts and prayers are with her family, friends, teammates, and all who were touched by her remarkable life. We ask for everyone to keep the Boyd family in your prayers during this very difficult time. And as always, we want to acknowledge here on Inside the HBC Sports Lab, Sports Lab the life of Jasmine Boyd. Uh, we'll take a moment to pause and reflect on the life of Jasmine Boyd. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowerment J-A-X. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slowburn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Welcome back to Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, baby Drew and Wilton Jackson. Let's talk about it. It is MEAC Media Day. Um, guys, it's just like the sweat. Uh, where we saw a bit of um, some, if you will, some uh, murmuring, if you will, but uh, the uh, defendant, MEAC champion, not predicted to finish first uh, in the MEAC as we take a look at the predicted order of finish. 
uh, coming in, uh, Delaware State. Then you have uh, Norfolk State, South Carolina State in third, Morgan State. I'm sorry, Morgan State in third. Howard picked to finish second. Then North Carolina Central. They are picked to be the class of the MEAC and represent the MEAC uh, in the Celebration Bowl this upcoming season. Thoughts? Any surprises? Wilton, AD, uh, what say you got? Charles, I have no surprise. Go ahead, AD. Go ahead. I have no surprise. This actually probably came in right where I thought it would come in with Central uh, being one, Howard being two. Uh, yeah, no surprises. Norfolk receiving a first place vote. A L- little bit of a shocker. Also, South Morgan State only receiving one first place vote was also a shocker to to me. The split between Howard and Central on the first place votes, that's probably par for the course for what I was expecting. I, think the, I, I, was, I was about to say Howard with the preseason offense and defensive players of the year. Uh, yeah, um, I think a lot of questions surrounding the quarterback position. Very interesting. Uh, you have uh, North Carolina Central pick to finish first in the yet. You know, Charles, I've actually talked to Jared Hunter before, and he's one to to keep a chip on his shoulder, just in general. So I'm sure when he saw this, it's North Carolina Central coming out on top above them to, to be predicted to finish number one. I'm sure that's something he's going to take into fall camp saying, OK, yes, uh, we just played in the Celebration Bowl a year ago and we defended and represented the MEAC, but yet we didn't get predicted to to, to be first. Uh, if I'm a player, I, f- I feel a certain type of way about that. Just being honest. Um, that was the one of the surprises for me because I'm I'm more to, I'm one to lean on the fact that if the champion until beaten should be number one. That's just me. Mm. Uh, you know, I would have still probably put Howard number one then North Carolina Central. Another point that that, that stood out too was the Morgan State only getting one first place vote. Uh, that I guess. Was a yeah, like Morgan State, I think people might have forgot just how close they were to potentially making it to a celebration ball, per se. They were in the mix at one point in time, and I, last time I checked, their defense is probably still going to be lethal in this upcoming year. Uh, South Carolina State kind of fell where I expected them to be. However, I will say this, because the coach that Chennis Berry is, I won't be surprised if they make some surprises. I know that might sound really crazy. But I won't be surprised if they 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 sneak up on some people um, in the MEAC. Uh, as far as Norfolk State, Delaware State, that pretty much kind of landed where I thought it would be. Yeah. What's going to be interesting about South Carolina State, you mentioned uh, Chinnis Berry. What you failed to mention, Wilton, was the fact that Eric Phoenix, the quarterback, is coming also to yep. South Carolina State, who had all the success on the Division II level with Benedict, so does success on the D2 level translate into success on the FCS level for for Mr. Phoenix? And let's not forget about all those people down in uh, Miami who were having concerns about Florida A&M pulling out of the Orange Blossom Classic, could they could not have asked for a better matchup of BAC number one preseason number one, North Carolina Central versus SWAC East number one, Alabama State oh, preseason oh, number one, Alabama oh, State, yeah, in the opening game of the season. So those people in the OBC, whether they had some inkling of this or not. They got it right. If you want a matchup without Florida a and this is the matchup that you want. Here's a question I wanted to throw out there in Norfolk State coming in uh, at fourth, Dawson Odom's team. And if I'm not mistaken, the stat that I read, uh, 19 starters or guys who had significant time last year on the Norfolk State roster coming back. Uh, have we discounted uh, – uh, the Spartans up there in the MEAC. 
I don't think we have for now for where they sit now. I mean, anything can change once the season starts. I mean, let's 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 take a step back and even look at where Norfolk State was, say, maybe in the beginning of the season. Like at one point in time, of course, it's the beginning of the season. You're still, you know, working through kinks and, and, and really trying to see what you have in a team. But then obviously when it matters the most and down the stretch, they, you know, or through the midway part of the season and down the stretch, they kind of fell by the wayside and, and things happen. And obviously the teams that are the most elite are going to emerge. But to your point, Charles, when you have a certain amount of starters coming back, that's always a good thing in most cases, especially if they were really young. Because that playing experience that they had as freshmen or sophomores, by the time they get to be, or even if they, as freshmen, um, by the time they get to their sophomore and junior year, that continuity matters. Those plays, those possessions, the same things, same mistakes you might have made in that first year, you don't make those same mistakes in that second or third year. So does this, does the when, I, when I've talked to coaches, especially just kind of getting into um, swag media day. I know we're talking about me at, but a lot of times these players, they look at these things, they use this motivation, but at the end of the day, the games are still played on the field. So with them being played on the field, this is only extra added motivation for them to go out and, and prove it otherwise. And Norfolk State, again, could potentially, you know, change their, their, their mindset or change the way that they perform in recent years. It just depends on what happens in these games. Very interesting uh, thing to look at with regards to uh, when we talk about sweat, we talk about a quarterback lead. Uh, Miak, we, we look at the defense a little bit more. Uh, how big an impact is it with Otto Coons being uh, named first team uh, preseason all Miak? Uh, is, is a quarterback play in the Miak enough of a difference maker uh, the way that we see it in the sweat? We saw it at Central last year. Mm -hmm. Saw it at Central two years ago where the quarterback made the difference with those Central teams. Uh, now, now you got to be thinking, can I, can I give another example beyond that, though, is the question, Charles, as far as a quarterback, uh, how, how was quarterback last year was serviceable? Uh, yeah, you, you may be right where – Although you may get a diamond and rough every now and then, uh, quarterback play has not been the tell-all in this particular conference that's known for its defense and its running game, primarily because of the weather factor. Wow. Yeah, we, down in the south, you can sling the ball all the way around until November. Come mid-October, you up there at D.C., you better have a good ground game because the weather starts to turn and you need to rely on something besides being able to sling the ball all over the place. Heck, I know it's not uh, BAC, but let's not forget Virginia Union and Fayetteville State last year in the hurricane game where mm -hmm. you, you, needed, you needed a great running game. I also want to know something else that y'all need to pay attention to. Circle City Classic. Mm. Central, Norfolk play each other in September. The only conference game. Mm. that's outside of those last five weeks, which is going to afford those two teams a later bye than the rest of the conference. So the winner of that game will have a leg up on the conference, obviously with the win uh, compared to everybody else. But the fact that they're going to, they're going to get that extra rest while everybody goes in the else in the conference goes five consecutive weeks. If a door folk can pull off, the quote-unquote upset early in Indy, we're definitely going to see Norfolk finish higher than the number four that they were predicted. Uh, mm -hmm. As you see, the first team all conference and first team all uh, first team all conference offense, first team all conference defense uh, uh, on the uh, screen there. Auto Cunes, quarterback Norfolk State, very interesting. Uh, and I mean, Howard has this one-two punch with Jared Hunt and Eden James in the backfield, and then they have a deep threat. And Casey Hawthorne, how important will it be for Howard to establish a new signal caller just to put the ball in some of the hands of these threats? Oh, it's going to be really important. Very important. Very important from, from the first day because how many times did we see the running game obviously open up for the passing game last year for Howard? That, that's, that's how it was. Um, but if you don't have that passing game, um, well, you're going to have that running game. But if you don't have that passing game, 
Uh, it could be it could be hard. There were times where they had positions where if they went up against certain teams, I can't remember exactly which game, but they had certain times where they struggled to run the ball in certain positions. I want to say that maybe maybe have been that game against Hampton when it when it mattered the most down the stretch because they lost that game to Hampton. If I'm not correct, if, if I'm correct, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they lost. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Hampton made a uh, comeback in the fourth quarter against them. Exactly, exactly. So being able to pass the ball and pass it around the field is going to be essential for them. Defense, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be too, too worried about. I know they're going to, they're going to be prepared. Uh, the running game, Eden James, Jerry Hunter, we know that the impact player that Casey Hawthorne is going to be. It's going to be extremely important for them to be able to pass that ball. Yeah. As you see the names on the screen, uh, Smith Brown from uh, South Carolina State, Keyshawn Tony. Uh, Eric Brown, Nick Tice, uh, Cam Johnson, all representing South Carolina State. Trayvon Branch, offensive line from Morgan State. Darius Fox from Howard. Uh, Trayvon Humphrey, round out the first team uh, all-conference offense, uh, representing North Carolina Central on the defensive side of the ball. And I always pay attention, especially when I'm looking uh, at me on the defensive side of the ball, the defense, defensive line, linemen and the linebackers. Uh, Jaden Taylor from uh, Central. Elijah Williams, Morgan State. Stuart Howard. Keyshawn Lynch, Norfolk State, Aaron Smith, linebacker, tough linebacker, uh, South Carolina State, A.J. Richardson, Eric Hunter, of course, we called his name all last year, Eric mm-hmm. Hunter with Morgan State, Cole Jones from Central, Kenny Gallup, preseason uh, defensive player of the year for representing Howard, Jamar Benjamin, uh, Taron Mallory, Juan Velarde, uh, Dylan West, and Keith Jenkins round out the first team all-conference defense. You know, when we come back out of break, it's, it's a name sitting out there, uh, especially uh, for South Carolina State. It, it turned the wheels in my head to thinking, who is the surprise team coming up in the MEAC? Uh, we'll take a quick break, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that on the other side. Who are some of the people who might turn your heads this upcoming season? Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www. Dot slowburnwaco.com Compress the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they want a law yeah. And who the ball, ball, ball. So listen to Professor uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention yes, Cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. Welcome back to Inside the HBCU Sports Lab uh, And guys, full disclosure I'm, I'm gonna tell you uh, I, I can't wait uh, for uh, the uh, MEAC uh, Monday morning press conferences because uh, Chinese Berry. I just love listening to Chinese Berry. Hell, I'm 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 mm, some years old and I want to put on him when I listen to uh, Chinese Berry. But um, I, I got to look in, you know, Dr. Cavill's uh, uh, Black College National Champion, uh, uh, Small College National Champion with Benedict comes over to South Carolina State. 
AD, you mentioned, he brings his quarterback with him. He's got a bevy of uh, a first team, uh, uh, all conference, preseason, all conference performers uh, at the ready. How big an impact is Chinnis Berry coming into this league and coming more specifically to South Carolina State? Chinnis Berry is one of the biggest chilies and motivators I have ever come across in the in the coaching profession, having seen him, I wouldn't necessarily say up close, but having seen him uh, a few times when I've had to cover Benedict, uh, like like you say, Charles, that if there's anybody who at our age can get us to run through a wall, <laughs> it's going it's going to be Chinnis Barry. <laughs> and, and, and if you notice, you you mentioned those first team selections. Did you notice where three of those first team selections were, Charles? On the offensive line, huh? Offensive line. Yeah. What did Chinnis Berry used to coach when he was at Southern? O-line. So, those Benedict teams, what were they built by? Offensive line. O-line and D-line. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, and as good as their offensive line was, their defensive line was twice as better, probably having one of the best de- defensive lines in Division Two football. So, if you're going to watch anything about South Carolina State, watch the battle in the trenches and see what South Carolina State could do. Can he do it year one is the question. Remember, <laughs> it took him a couple of years at South Carolina State to get everything right, and then he went on and won his last 23 games at, at Benedict. So, is are we looking at a similar timeline where it's going to take him a year or two to get it together, but to go back into the Wayback Machine, that was pre-Portal. Hmm. Well, I, I, I mentioned Chinnis Berry as being kind of my potential head turner uh, no. team uh, in, in, in the MEAC. Uh, do you have a potential head turner team that wasn't North Carolina Central? Uh, I'm kind of along the lines with you because I, 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 and granted, when you think about North Carolina Central, you you knew they would be near the top. You knew how it would be at the top. Um, and when you when you look at, uh, I think for me, when I look at South Carolina State, you know that this is a, a Chinnis Berry who you know, like you said, you run through a wall for him. Uh, you know the way he's going to coach his teams. Uh, to AD's point about the way that those teams are built, this is a team who was able to pass the ball they, at, at Benedict. They had a, a, a lethal passing attack. They were they were also able to run the ball. So when I was looking at their schedule, after they play FAMU, they have some non-conference games. A lot, actually, a lot of non-conference games before they get actually back into some conference play. Well, will they win those non-conference games like that? We don't really know. But what it does do is if you if you get some wins, even if you don't get the wins, it prepares you even more for this conference play that you can that you're gonna be getting ready to, to go into. So some of these teams that say maybe it is a central. Maybe it is a Howard that might be five and zero. Oh. Well, you 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 getting a a, a, a a battle tested team in South Carolina State that might be ready to give you an upset. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but it can happen. Hmm. Hmm. But South Carolina State does not build their schedule. I hate to say it. They don't build it for to please the fans. They build their schedule as a championship level schedule. First of all, South Carolina State gonna go get their checks. They gonna play at least two check games per year, if not if not three. Then they're gonna play some other top level FCS teams regionally. They may put a Virginia Lynchburg. They may put another Division uh, two team on their schedule just to kind of get o- get over the hump. But they build that schedule to get their team battle tested mm-hmm. for uh, conference. Now, a lot of that schedule was probably made before Chinnis Berry was there. Yeah. But it's going to be interesting, number one, to see if Chinnis Berry continues that tradition. Because if you look at South Carolina State's schedule, non-conference, they've always been upside down, non-conference. Time, they're always right side up and battling for the conference title there, uh, especially up under Buddy Pew. So, yeah, you're right, Will. It's going to be interesting to see – What's going to happen? Even though you may have a one in five or one in six South Carolina State team coming into conference play, and everybody remember, <laughs> all these play at least six, if not seven, non-conference games because 
for only five conference games to build because so they're going to play more nine conference games than conference games. Charles, I just want to mention to that to that schedule point. So after FAMU, they played the Citadel, Georgia Southern, uh, North Carolina A and T, Tennessee Tech, Fort Valley State, and then their first conference game isn't until October 26th, and that's homecoming against Delaware State. And then they turn around on a short week on Halloween and play North Carolina Central. That could be an upset. That, that that's that's an interesting one. I, I where, call where's that the Central game at? Yeah, where where's that play at? That game is in Orangeburg. Ooh. Oh, on so they, they get homecoming. They get homecoming, and then they get a they they're at home on a short week. Exactly. Oh yeah, that's that that's that's why yeah, I they don't have homecoming. Have hang, they don't have <laughs> homecoming hangover. They're gonna be all right. Yep. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Uh, shout out to Dr. Bill checking in. Tremendous job this morning uh, hosting uh, the MIAC preview show uh, prior to uh, them things getting things uh, up and underway uh, up there. Uh, tremendous uh, insight that you got from not only the coaches, but the players as well. So I uh, definitely want to send a shout out to Dr. Bill checking in from Orlando. Uh, let me ask this question, guys. And, and do we make this mistake, uh, especially in the media? And AD, you touched on it with regards to the non conference play. And, and the number of games uh, where you don't have these MEAC teams facing each other. I don't know. We get kind of towards October and we start taking a look at the schedule. And like you mentioned, they might be one and four, or one and five. And it's like, eh. and then all of a sudden, that finishing kick <laughs> uh, hits in probably late October, going into November, uh, when things are really on the line in the MEAC. Uh, do we make that mistake in terms of looking at? Uh, how viable a team is, especially once we get into the thick of things in October. Do we now remember two years ago when South yeah. Carolina State won the national championship? I know you remember, Charles. Oh, very much so. Uh, they, they were, what, five and six coming into the Celebration Bowl? Or six, or six, or six or five or whatever. Six, 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 six and five. five. Yeah. They six were six and five, and five yeah. because, because if I remember right, their one win may have been against somebody like Virginia Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. to put them uh, over the hump so that they did not come in upside down into the celebration bowl. And in reality, and I hate to say this, and John Grant's going to have to have his marketing team on uh, get, give them a bonus. Sooner or later, we're going to have an upset, upside down team make it to the celebration bowl, especially when you consider this year and next year, there's a 12-game schedule. And you're gonna have somebody go one and six, zero oh and seven, nine conference, and then run through the conference. And finish and the kick five and, and seven. It's gonna be it? interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, finish the season five and seven, and even if they win the celebration bowl, they'll be upside down, holding up, holding up the trophy. So, yeah. uh, brother Grant, I hope you got that plan uh, put somewhere in the in the file cabinet because sooner or later. You are going to have to activate it. But like I said, it doesn't matter about what they do non-conference. Can they win those last five games? That's all That's all these teams care about. So it's just it's just like our basketball teams who go to the NCAA tournament. <laughs> you know, most of the times our basketball teams are still upside down, upside down, upside down in March. Mm. Uh, very interesting. What is it that I'm missing? With regards to North Carolina Central, pick to finish first today. Uh, Trey Oliver trying to get his troops back uh, to the Celebration Bowl. But like I said, I, I started thinking about Dawson Odoms. I started taking a look at uh, Howard. And, and, and you know, uh, North Carolina Central, they are picked to finish first. What did I overlook? What is it about this team, uh, especially – uh, that, you know, if you're, you're sitting back over there in Durham, like, I can't believe y'all questioning us. <laughs> you go, you can go ahead, Eddie, first. I'll go after you. I was going to say, this is, the, this is the segment in which we need Joshua Sam Sr. to come <laughs> on and tell us hey, why that was, that, that was a Central is call. going to be. Yeah. Be call for <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> But I, I, I know Central has always had a good wide receiver room. Mm -hmm. Now, do they have anybody to get the ball to the wide receiver is going is going to be the question. Yeah. That's what the thing is. And, and, and let's be real. 
they coach their teams to win their enduro. And for the last f- four years, Trey Oliver has done a good job getting his teams prepared because you saw you saw Central coming. Every year they improved until they uh, until the win year they got to the national championship. And even last year, we were we were thoroughly disappointed with them not making a celebration bowl, but them still making the FCS playoffs. So Central is a team. They have they have the culture. They have everything in place. Can they replace the quarterback? I think that's the question Ooh. there in Durham. Million dollar question. Wilson, go for it. Yeah, that's going to be the biggest thing as, as to what AD said. Can they replace the quarterback? Because they have some dynamic playmakers still coming back. You talk about uh, Jamar Taylor. Uh, he's an impact player for them. He's coming back. And I think you, you you when you say, what did you miss? I don't think it's maybe so much of what you miss. It's just the fact that there's a lot of continuity that's been built with North Carolina, North Carolina Central and what uh, Coach Oliver has been able to do with that program. And I think that unless something drastically changes, we're going to see them for the most part, at least somewhat be in the mix. Obviously, last year when we started the season, it was a, a resounding thought that North Carolina Central will probably still be playing at the end of the season in the Celebration Bowl. But things happen. The games have to be played. Howard had the opportunity. Uh, you know, they didn't take take care of, of, of the situation that they need to take care of to get there. Um, but I think that you're going to see – you're still going to get a very much competitive brand of football coming out of Durham – um, and, and that's essentially, I think, at the minds of voters that, that pick these teams in this order, that's what they were thinking about. Mm. Go ahead, Eddie. W- one last comment. One last comment. It, it would not surprise me if we see a trend where we see a BAC team consistently in the FCS playoffs because their schedule, their non conference schedule, allows a second-place team to get to the FCS playoffs, unlike in the SWAC because the non-conference games you play – I mean, let's look at the SWAC non-conference schedule. You're going to play a check game, and you're going to play a Division II, and then you're going to play an FCS. Those those are typically the three non-conference games. Well, that doesn't allow – usually doesn't allow a SWAC team to get an at-large to the FCS playoffs. Where in the in the MEAC, especially this year, you have seven non-conference games. If you're playing five FCS schools and you go four and one, like Central did last year, against those FCS schools, even if you don't win the MEAC, you're still going to probably make it to the playoffs. And if you go four and one in conference, as long as those FCS programs remain reputable throughout the season, meaning like they're also still somewhat winning games as well. Uh, let me ask this quick question. Well, I mean, you're talking CAA, Big South, and uh, Patriot League. Those are the three conferences that they typically right. play against. Right. Right, right. Can Can we see a deep run? And I, and I say this uh, with the with the transfer portal, with uh, the way, especially at the FCS level, I see teams. I, I don't see a, a a huge disparity like I once uh, used to see. Is there a point in time when we can see a deep run, especially from a MEAC team in the FCS playoff? Anybody. That's me. <laughs> yeah, anybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't know. I, I thought you were pondering, so I was leaving. Yeah, no, nah, me too. <laughs> My bad. But, yeah, I, I think you could definitely see a deep run. Obviously, number, the number one thing is going to be health. The number two thing is how far are you gonna make us travel when we do go to that to that FCS game. If they ever allow us, we're, we're not gonna host the game. Let's be real; we know we're not gonna host the game. But can we get a game close enough where we can take over the stadium? That's going to be the question. If we can get those and we can bring the band, we may start seeing uh, teams uh, start making a run. Hmm. Well. I think a lot of it goes back to another another point that Eddie was talking about in terms of the way these schedules are constructed. And I think that if you're having the competition from these these teams, from these leagues like the CAA and the Big South, and, and not like the bare bottom teams in these conferences, like the teams that are religiously going to the FCS tournament, I mean the FCS playoffs every year, um, if MEAC teams are beating them, and not only just the the, the premier MEAC teams, but if say if like right now, obviously South Carolina State wasn't picked to be number one, but let's say South Carolina State maybe gets one or two wins against some of these you know non-conference teams that may have potentially played in the FCS, 
when when the, the the powers that be look at these schedules and look at that, it's like, oh, if this is being done over a couple of years of time, let's say maybe a five to ten year span, you kind of have to start considering, OK, this brand of me at football that it once was is not exactly the same as it used to be. It's different. It's growing. Talent mm -hmm. is there. And these same teams that beat some of these teams in the regular season, if given the opportunity to put them in the FCS playoffs, they've shown that they can beat these teams. So why not be able to give them a chance to compete on the biggest stage in the FCS playoffs? Interesting point. Well, I'll tell you what, all the data is in from the SIC, the CIAA, the SWAC, and the MEAC. Uh, as we go to our last segment, we'll get you guys observations, news, and notes from the whole diaspora, if you will, of the HBCU conferences as well as North Carolina a &T, Tennessee State, and Hampton. We'll be right back here on Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Itchy, squirmy, scratchy, family not getting clean. Get Charmin Ultra Strong. Go get them. It just cleans better with a diamond weave texture your family can use less while still getting clean. Goodbye, itchy squirm. Hello, clean bottom. <laughs> <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? At Hampton Law, our primary goal is to provide non-traditional yet effective solutions and redefine the approach to client legal concerns. As your trusted legal advisor, we believe in sophisticated, personalized services that eliminate the confusion and complexity sometimes associated with legal matters. Our high standard for client care and concern, coupled with our extensive legal knowledge and skills, make Hampton Law a resource focused on the protection of the client's interest and overall goals. We value our clients and truly enjoy working with them. Visit thamptonlaw.com to conveniently schedule an appointment online. Tamika Hampton, Esquire. 1631 Rock Springs Road, Suite 336, Apopka, Florida, 407-494-1471, thamptonlaw.com. No. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com When it comes to professional learning, teachers deserve better. From the leader in online learning, Stride brings you the Stride Professional Development Center, an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that gives teachers choice and flexibility, allowing them to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. It's time you take charge of your learning. Visit us today to get started. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love that and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. And welcome back here on Inside the HBCU uh, Sports Lab. Charles Bishop, A.D. Drew, and Wilton Jackson. And let me not do that. Tennessee State, Howard Hampton, they're all part of the HBCU diaspora. You don't have to text me, email me, none of that good stuff, or even do that to Dr. Gavilla. You know they're going to do that. I, yeah, I don't want Jamie Walker texting me <laughs> and then telling me, hey, we still HBCU. I, I, yes, you are. That's, we don't even have to do that. Uh, but When y'all when they, when they media day again? <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> so we got data here from all of the conferences, and um, the thing that jumps out for me, um, the robustness of all of these teams being broadcasted. Whether you're talking about uh, ESPN, HBCU Go, uh, Swag Digital. Uh, they put out their games that they will be having. Uh, huge North Carolina and T local distribution. 
uh, in return in regards to uh, the area uh, in North Carolina being able to watch North Carolina A&T games. But uh, we're in this uh, zygast, if you will, of you're going to be able to watch your team. We'll be able to get all the data in from Thursday through Saturday. Uh, but what were your, you know, sort of thoughts as we look back and reflect on uh, the various media days from around the conferences? And I'll start with off with you, Abu. Uh, for me, as the one, the one that I attended, obviously was was the SWAC. I think that you know there's a lot of excitement around SWAC football. I mean, obviously, let's just talk about just the number of coaches, the new coaches that we're gonna have, right? I mean, and, and granted, not even just that, but like the the teams that have you know retained their coaches, um, the teams that are that are are predicted to to make some significant steps, right? We're looking at Alabama State; they were picked number one over FAMU. Um, that, that if, again, if I'm fam, you as a team who just won the celebration bowl, uh, I'm thinking to myself, like, we're still the champs granted different coach, coach Causey. Um, but you know, when you think about an Alabama state team, that's going to be, I mean, I'm really excited to see what they're going to look like. You, you, Charles, you in Texas, you know exactly where I'm going with that. When I <laughs> talk about Alabama state, um, yeah. but I'm excited to see them, you know, be able to see if they're going to have that same balance on offense that they have on defense. Last year, we know defense was lights out. Um, I'm looking to see what this what that's going to look like. I'm also looking to see and I'm excited to see what Coach Cosby puts together with FAMU. Uh, I haven't talked to him before. He's a no nonsense coach. Um, they have a lot of players returning and coming back. Obviously, some all swag players um, in, in, in that nature, too. And then, of course, Jackson State. We know what TC is building what they're doing. Um, I think the, the thing for them is just going to be, are they going to be able to finish games? Mm. You know, are they able to finish games and stay healthy in a lot of places. Uh, and then when you look at Bethune Cookman, now I, I know you talk about teams that, you know, could potentially shake up things or whatever, Well, we know they had a really good recruiting class. Mm. I don't see them necessarily clearly don't necessarily see them winning the sweat, but I don't think this will be the same Bethune Cookman team we've seen over the last two to three years. Just my thoughts. That's just me on, on, on July 23rd saying that. I just I just don't believe we'll, that'll be the same with Thune Cookman team. Um, and then in the West, of course, you got Alcorn with a new coach, uh, you know, Southern with a new coach, Coach Graves. I'm, I'm, a, I'm really excited to see what he does. He knows that that program, uh, you know, obviously the only coach to, to, to coach within um, the Bayou Classic both times. Like, I'm, I'm excited to see what he does. But then also uh, Chris Dishman at Texas Southern. Like what he's gonna put together. So the, the between the players coming in that have come into the conference, recruiting classes, uh, the new coaches that will make things different. Maybe this might be a year where we get a, a, a I don't know if it'll be a, a, a situation where we get a new coach to lead a team to a celebration ball, a swag championship. But it's, it's definitely a possibility with the number of new head coaches that are in the conference this year. Quick pivot, AD. Uh, especially when we take a look at sort of the environment that we're in now. Grambling moved on from their coach after a couple of seasons. Southern, a season and a half, moved on from their coach. Uh, the thing that jumps out for me with regards to college football as it is now, uh, fan bases expect you to win, win now, uh, probably now more than any other time that we've watched uh, college football uh, with regards to – especially how we see uh, players move uh, uh, in the transfer portal. But coming into the season, who probably has that 600-pound gorilla kind of sitting on their back? It, it's hard to identify, Charles, who has that 600-pound gorilla when you look around HBCU football and everyone still has their hello, my name is tag <laughs> on, their, on their chest with all the booths. <laughs> Once upon a time, you were able to find you, you knew Grammy, Eddie Robinson, you know, uh, Fab you, Jake Gaither, uh, Billy Joe. You you knew the names with, with Jeffries with uh, South Carolina State. You knew who was going to run these programs. You knew the values that these coaches were going to have. And you knew the type of players they were going to recruit. Now, you don't even know at any point in time have we ever, ever had where we like, we don't know who the starting quarterback is for our team. Because you see that there's always been this cycle. You've been there's always been this cycle. You've had you've had this guy, he was with the program for four years, he was a two-year starter, 
and you know who the other guy is coming up behind him to take that position, be it quarterback, be it running back, linebacker, defensive end. It is hard to you obviously we root for the names on the on the uh on the front of the jersey and, and our in our color. But it is hard when you really have no clue as to who the hell's name is on the back of the jersey now. But if you think if you want to talk about teams that have the the big monkeys on their back, James Coles, bam you. Mm-hmm. With everything that's going on at Florida A and M, with everything that's going on at Florida A and M. Since they have won that celebration bowl, fans of the orange and green need a distraction. They mm-hmm. want a distraction, and they're commanding a distraction. We we wanted you in this seat. The athletic director did not want did not want to hire you. We demanded that they hire you. You cannot go down and lay an egg if you're James Coles. Because I be damned if we if you gonna prove that she was right and she shouldn't have hired you. So I think James Cole said Florida A and M has the biggest monkey on his back because of everything. I mean, hell, I mean we 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 we, we didn't have Jeremy Gate, we, we our president to resign, we didn't had uh, tornadoes come through the campus. You know, that's all anybody in Orange Green is thinking about. We need distraction of football and we need some W's. To go along to go along with it. Let me ask this question: Is that because of the fervor uh, of the fan base of FAMU, the fervor of the fan base of Grambling, uh, the fervor of the fan base of Southern Jackson State? Who, some of these fan bases, uh, let's be honest, that that that, that, that gorilla is a little heavier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that gorilla is a little heavier. Uh, can you quote unquote kind of skate under the radar, if you will, for until you kind of build up your recruits? Uh, is are we still in that day and age? I think more and more <laughs> because, like you, like you, like you said, or like both of you guys have said, in in a sense that we're in this microwave popcorn popcorn culture. You don't have as much time anymore. And this is not even just from the smallest of levels like the HBCUs. We're talking about even the Power Five levels, too. We see it all the time now. And so to AD's point, FAMU fans are definitely going to be expecting wins. i give you another program. Take it take it, take it, it back. Uh, uh, well, take it to the Swag West. Look at Alcorn. How many – I had to envision not seeing Fred McNair at Alcorn. That's what we did. It didn't even feel right initially, mm. you know. And to know that, like, I guarantee you, they still expecting wins to come out of Lorman, Mississippi. And if they don't, you will hear about it. Why nobody is? What about in Huntsville? Huntsville? I was about to say, uh, uh, up there in Huntsville. I mean, uh, Demetra, she pointed out Connell Maynard up there at Alabama A&M. I mean, he's let, let's be real. He's on the clock. Oh yeah, Connell Maynard is is on the clock. Not only if Connell Mayner loses to Alabama State for the third year in a row in the Magic City Classic, Eddie Robinson and Robinson Jr. has lost the Magic City Classic since he's uh, been there. But if he loses for the third year in a row, Connell Mayner may not make it through the season. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting as we come up to on the top of the hour, guys. Phenomenal discussion, as always. Uh, you know, uh, we'll carry it on with whomever the host is on Thursday. AD Drew, I'm pulling on your towel that way uh, <laughs> in regards to Thursday. But uh, very interesting conversation. MEAC Media Day today. Uh, all the data is in from all the conferences. And you guys, you, you dug into it. We talked a little bit about uh, a little bit of, of all of them over the past few weeks with regards to the SIAC, CIAA. Uh, and let's talk, you know, before we sign off, a t can they make a move? Hampton, can they make a move? Tennessee State and OVC. How much time we got for that in the next uh, couple of minutes? Guys, go for it with regards to those three programs. I think when I look at Tennessee State, they made strides last year. 
This is a team who had a, a, a winning season, obviously started off really, really, really high, um, but they still ended up winning a winning season. I still like State and what he's trying to bring to the program. Um, I think that if they continue to build on what they established and the foundation that they created last season, um, I think they're going to be okay. Defensive wise, like I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not as, as worried. They did lose some people, but he, he, one thing I've noticed about the way that their defense is that very, very tough. Um, they, when they hit you, they obviously going to hit you hard. But the one thing that always bothers me about Tennessee State, just within recent years and specifically under Coach George, is that quarterback situation. Mm. You know, what, what are we going to get? Are we going to get a, 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 a mobile quarterback who you know that's a, an athlete? But is he going to actually be able to make the, the proper passes to get the ball down the field when it's, you know, when the game is on the line? So sure. that's always a big concern for me with Tennessee State. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, how, how they can kind of continue to, to move up and progress. Do we see progression, A.D. Drew? Uh, one place where we think we know who the starting quarterback is going to be, and I say think because we still have not seen the roster, so we may have to delete this segment out if he's no longer on the roster, is at Hampton with Chris Zellis at quarterback. Last year, 27 uh, combined touchdowns uh, and 2,600 yards uh, combined passing and rushing. The one place where we think we know who the, who the incumbent quarterback is and the one place where we uh, expect the quarterback to put up some numbers. And he do that in that ultra competitive CAA where yeah. he stole a couple of games last year. Yeah. In that CAA. So Chris Zellers right now, preseason, is probably the best quarterback in HBCU land. Will he will he be able to live live up to that and lead Hampton to get above five hundred in that in that in that conference where that's what, the CAA usually has three teams going to the uh, FCS playoffs. Mm -hmm. So Hampton getting to 500 in that conference would be a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. Can a and rebound and do what they did that, the, the, uh, when, they, when they were in the Big South? Mm -hmm. When they were competing in the Big South, and then it's like the Big South kind of caught up with them, especially when they moved from the Big South to the CAA, those – that, that switch, three switches in five years, three conferences in five years, but like caught up with them competitively because mm -hmm. they didn't know what type of athlete to recruit for for these for these different conferences. Tennessee State, can we just get y'all to go to the doggone game? That's all I want to see from Tennessee State. Can we get some attendance at Tennessee State? I'm going to leave it there. Great place to put a pin in it here for July 23rd <laughs> episode. <laughs> 527, the 80 drew a grenade to, uh, for the walk-off. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you guys know how we always uh, finish things up. I'll start it off. Course, AD. Lecture. Wilton. Lecture. I knew it. I knew it. Ah, yeah. Some of sabbatical that did it to him again. <laughs> Dismissed.